So it has recently been brought to my attention that uh, quite a few years ago, basically Chuck Smith, if you know who that is, of Calvary Chapel, he also deviated from the path and he has uh, died now. I don't know how long he's been away, but I'm really familiar with Calvary Chapel. That's what I went to when I first got saved and was there for a long time. And even our church, too, went astray and brought the shack in and changed the character and nature of who Yahweh is, which is like one of the biggest no-nos. It really actually ties back in a case could be made for breaking the first command. You might go, well, breaking the first command is thou shall have no other gods, right? But in changing who and what God is, you are committing that sin. It's very serious. And... <clears throat> And that's something that we really need to hold the line on and make sure that people understand who and what the makeup of God is. It's very dangerous to start playing around with augmenting who Yahweh is or who Jesus is. And <clears throat> it says here that Chuck Smith believed that Catholics are basically Christians too. It says here on October the 11th, 2011, a caller, Ben, from Orange, I don't know what Orange means, Orange County or something, called into Pastor's perspective and asked about how he can maintain his relationship with those that he knows at a Calvary and Harvest Fellowship as he is Catholic and will remain that way. That's very strange that he wants to stay in error, but he wants to go to this other church, a Greg Laurie church. That's very strange. And resolve to be different. On November 23rd, 2011, then another caller asked if a Christian and a Catholic should marry. And Chuck Smith says that one can resolve the differences and Catholics are basically Christians too. So this is pretty short. Let's listen. For that. All right. Back we go to the phones to Orange, California with Ben on the line. Ben, welcome to Pastor's Perspective. Hi. Hi, how are you? Fine, thank you. Uh, I am a royal minister. I uh, love going to uh, your men's conferences, and uh, I fellowship with quite a few people at Calvary Chapels. Uh, um, it's a great glorious harvest. And uh, I have a question because uh, sometimes I have a hard time understanding um, how I um, communicate with people um, of the Protestant faith because I'm Catholic. And mm -hmm. sometimes we um, have communication issues, and they want to get into apologetics. And, uh, um, you know, I love the worship and the fellowship with those with different people, but uh, I'm going to hang on to my faith as well. And I'm just curious uh, what you think about Okay, good question there, Ben. In fact, we're glad you're going to these events. We're glad you listened to this program. Okay, Chuck, what about that? Ben, I have a cousin who was a mother superior in the Catholic Church, and uh, she was just a wonderful Christian, loved her, and we had great conversations together. And I didn't try to convert her from Catholicism, nor did she try to convert me uh, into becoming a Catholic. It's just we both recognize that, uh, you know, we have we have the same Lord and the same uh, faith, you know. And so uh, we just, uh, you know, on those things that we agreed upon, we just agreed upon. And we didn't really bring up the things where there were disagreements. All right, we're going to go to Ontario, California, and talk to Beverly. Beverly, you're on Pastor's Perspective. Welcome. You have about a minute left, so if you can state your question. Yeah, have oh, hold on. Was that in Yahoo? <clears throat> Who is that? How would I even track down who that is? Um, is this in Yahoo, or is this somebody that just has a physical appearance very similar to his? I don't know. So this is Crouch, and then this is his son, I, uh, Matt, isn't it? Matt Crouch. Obviously the Pope. Let me know in the comments if, if you know who this is. I might be able to track down an article or something, but uh, just going blind, it might be a little bit difficult. That really looks like him, doesn't it? I mean, if it's not, he's ah, 
Got a doppelganger running around out there. <clears throat> that is very interesting to me because, see, there is a partnership that is behind the lines that you don't see. You have to connect it together. So you have Rome, Babylon. I'm going to say Rome Masonry. And if that is Netanyahu or a representative from Israel, I'm going to tell you that this is Israel Babylon. And I see Babylon a little bit different. I don't want to spend a lot of time in this. Most people try to say that Babylon is merely a religious organization, or they will say that it is merely a location, you know, some, some place on the map to the exclusion of everything else. And the way that I look at Babylon is that it's all that and so much more. And that really, just like Jesus Christ has a wife, the bride who is betrothed to him and about ready to get married to him, so does the Antichrist have a mate of humanity that yokes with him and is forming. And it's all the way from the leadership down to the masses. And that will all be codified at a point in time later on down the road with the mark of the beast. But <clears throat> I see all this ecumenicism as, you know, the walking down the aisle, getting closer and closer. That's how I see Babylon. And I see those parallels and those contrasts, uh, a city of light, the church is called. And we can see how the whole earth is polluted except for those who run to Jesus and repent and get out of it. But for those who enter into this religious, one world, one government, one new humanity, I really see that as being the counterpart to that city of light as a city of dark and not a city as in like one geographical location to the exclusion of the rest of the earth but really all of those things as the earth with the exception of anybody that repents and gets out. So um, I will have to research that and see what I can come up with. But <clears throat> you have uh, very dangerous ecumenical ties that are all leading people to eventually this Jerusalem as the world capital and uh Israel is the house that you must yoke with in your religion with the Noahide sub laws coming and the Antichrist being that top kingpin, that that Messiah. So I can see why people would want to be deconstructing the nature of who God is, deconstructing and blending those lines of, of various religions into one. Um and uh, tying these things back underneath Israel. That is very dangerous because they're going to have a, a false Messiah for you. That Jesus warned you that that uh, an imposter would be coming in Matthew 24. We talk about a lot. Beverly, Beverly, you're on Pastor's Perspective. Welcome. You have about a minute left, so if you can state your question. Yes, I have a question. Is it right for a Catholic woman to marry a Christian man even though she's pregnant with his child? All right, Pastor Chuck? Well, I don't uh, see that, uh, well, there's going to be difficulty, uh, you know, is it, you know, uh, but if you can resolve the differences, I don't think that they're that great, and I think that you probably, uh, if you're pregnant with his child, you should marry him, and, uh, and of course, I think that, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's all right, it can, uh, uh, you can resolve the differences, I, and I think that uh, it's. it's it, it, I know. I know of many uh, of that. You know. You know, Catholics are basically Christians too, and uh, so uh, I think that uh, you know what the differences are are much less than uh, what a lot of people face and are overcoming in their marriages. I think the more important questions are, is he a good man and yeah. do they love each other? Mm -hmm. Can I so think fasten your seat belts. Wow. There is no one who is good. No, not one. And for that. All right, back we go.
I'm not going to go into that again. But did not Paul say, do not be unequally yoked? I mean, it's pretty simple. When we don't follow directions, as we already saw, a walking, talking, breathing, and sample or sample, uh, an example, all those things are the same thing of our parents when God gave one very clear direct command to father and mother, that is to say Adam and Eve in the garden, and they did not follow directions, the result of turning away from that which is good to that which is evil brought about disastrous consequences. Amen? Now, yes, we're going to sin. We're going to screw up. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're on this planet either justified by Jesus and walking in sanctification, imitating Paul as he imitates Christ, or you are about ready to one day when you die, go and pay for your own sins. So sin is a big deal, but you know, the Bible is so kind and so gentle and so loving and so instructive because it knows the Holy Spirit knows you go and you tie and a believer and an unbeliever together. You are asking for a lot of trouble a lot of consequence. And so we can be dumb, right? We're called sheep for a reason. We can be so ignorant and so foolish. And when we go by our feelings and when a pastor leads you and tells you to go by your feelings or that pastor goes by his feelings and completely dogs the word of God in, in something that is so clear, uh, that's scary. That is scary to me. See, I I found out about this a little bit ago and I've been kind of processing it, right? Because I don't do hero worship. You go off away from the word of God and I, I'm not going to sit there and throw the Bible under the bus. I'm going to throw your ministry away. So I'm, I'm kind of upset about this because this personally on some level touches my life. But you know what? This... At the end of the day, this is about elevating Jesus. And anyhow, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, had Paul tell us, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 17, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial or Satan, and what part hath he that believeth with an infidel, an unbeliever? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, and as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not that unclean thing, and I will receive you. So he wants everybody to get saved and let the Holy Spirit and the water wash them. Not everybody does that, though. So for him to tell that woman in the second half of the clip to just, yeah, go ahead. Catholics are basically Christians. Go ahead and get married to that unbeliever because you're carrying a child. I mean, yes, it's kind of beyond the point of saying, you know, we ought not to have premarital, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you know, she's pregnant now. That's that's you know, a consequence of not following God, following our own feelings and, you know, the chemical romance and that whole thing. So that's not good. But then to further now tie that relationship together for all of eternity, well, not eternity, but this life and bringing a child into, I mean, you've got a major sticky wicket. And where was the gospel ever represented? Now, granted, this was a chunk, but this was the chunk that we have to go by. And so you hear him Telling the first caller as well that, you know, basically Catholicism and Christianity are the same. Now, we know that Billy Graham was working on that notion for a long time. And just like Hitler, uh, one of the people in, in Hitler's army, he said that if you just, you know, if you want to pass something off as the truth, you just tell a lie enough times and people will just get used to it. You just say this is this is the truth, but it's actually a lie. and this whole ecumenical lie seeks to take the, the, the false god of Catholicism, which Paul also warned us about. We talk about these verses a lot. Yeah. Because they're important and people are at a point now where they don't care about truth. 
That'll work. 2 Corinthians 11, 4, another Jesus. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, don't. You, you might well put up with him, he goes on to say. He also, um, he, well, there's more to the verse, so I kind of want to keep to the actual verse. I want to elevate this. I want to elevate Christ, but that's not very big. So if, if, if he that comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which we have not received, or which you have not received, or another gospel, another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. Second Corinthians 11, 4, we said. So this is a big deal. And check just... Blends them together, just like Billy Graham's ministry, just like all the ecumenical movements. Uh, there's more that, that, that we could talk about. You have this huge push for the, the creation of this coexist with the cross as one of the symbols. And we talk about it all the time. You're not going to hear the TV churches uh talking about this because i think they're all part of it i mean i would hate on one level i would hate to think that they are all in on it yet if they're going to have that position of influence over the masses boy if i was satan i wouldn't let a real born again christian get near my demon uh media box aka television or computer or cameras that gets that information to people I wouldn't let you near it if you were a real born again Christian. I'd hold those positions of power and reserve for those who bow to me and serve. If I was Satan, which I'm not, but I would, I would keep uh, the transgressors of the law who blend together these uh, religious identities and change the nature of God. I'd keep them in front of those cameras and I'd pay them handsomely to turn. Yeah, that's what I would do. Now, see, in coexist, you've got the fakey fake cross. And, and what you should do is you should have people bowing. You shouldn't bow before anything, but I'm saying to illustrate this, this point, this would be very clearly understood if you had people that were bowing in front of the cross that is the fake cross that blends together with all the rest of this because that is the apostate church, the fake church, the lying church, the church that is going through the tribulation. Well, now, wait a minute. Didn't you say that the church is not going through the tribulation? Well, there's the true church, which is not. Revelation 3.10, Jesus straight from his own lips says, I will keep you out, ek, out, out of that time of testing, for you have not denied my name. But and, and then also we know that the dead are raised, right? We know that from 1 Thessalonians 4.16, the dead are raised first. Well, so who? Well, the dead in Yahweh, obviously. All the people who have ever come to God in faith, irrespective of the means, the whatever blood it was, whether it was animal blood or Jesus Christ's blood, that faith in the blood, that faith like Abraham had, qualifies those people into that new creation in Christ that he is developing and so the the dead the past and present smyrna right people today are going to have their heads cut off and their houses burned and be raped and caged and hurt and harmed and everything else because they will be martyrs unto death so you have the real church living or dead and they are going to be leaving per the promises of god and paul the tribulation is for the fakes the unbelievers and there is a huge number of unbeliever fake apostate fakey fake fake fakington christians who are your near and dear treasured heroes that you get the most pseudo relationship on a one-way basis through the television and then you do hero worship. Oh, that was the other point of where I was, where I was going. So if this was true to what people are doing and people bowed before this thing, which you're not supposed to bow either, but people do it all the time because they don't care about truth. I would say not to do that, but people, people don't listen. People don't follow directions. You would have people bowing if this was 
you know, to be illustrated, which is actually happening, and doing hero worship. Oh, I love Jacob Prash. Oh, I love this this uh, Chuck Smith. Oh, I love this person and that, and so on and on and on it goes. And yet we we know that Catholicism has a different Jesus. We know that. They have a completely different gospel. They have a different everything. That's a problem. What's this? A different Jesus, work unto the Lord, disguise deceivers, poison their minds, take the Bible seriously and literally. Well, I mean, yeah, I can't argue with that. People hate the truth. They love them some lies. We probably won't look at this whole thing. I'll put a link in here below. In fact, I'll grab it now so I don't forget later. So that you can check this out. Now, whether you like chick publishing or not, this is pretty good. Our Roman Catholics Christians. Because there's a big game that these masons and turncoats and liars are playing on you. And this breaks it down pretty nice. Is there a slight chance that the Roman Catholic Church is really not Christian? Think of the horrifying consequences. If it is not, then billions of people have been deceived. If it's not, then the ecumenical movement is not of God. If it's not, then the Roman Catholic charismatic movement is not of God. If it's not, then Roman Catholics are headed for spiritual disaster. There's only one way to check it out, and that's with the Holy Inspired Word of God, the Bible. And they say, well, let's let's study Helen's life, this devout Catholic woman, to see what Catholicism teaches. Because it's going to be very different than a born-again believer and how they get saved. Helen's first sacrament is the sacrament of baptism. The Roman Catholic institution says that it's one of the, wow, seven channels of grace through which Helen <laughs> hopes to be saved. Helen cannot be exposed to Jesus, the blessed sacrament the wafer god because she is under the influence of evil spirits the priest exercises the demons by anointing helen with oil and putting salt in her mouth to preserve her from future influence of evil spirits that that's okay don't know nothing about that then she's baptized with water at this point she's supposedly wow because of water Cleansed of original sin. Okay, well, I see that Jesus Christ let out blood and water when his heart stopped and he had a cardiac arrest, which is actually, and he suffocated too, is, is from what I understand what, what happened to him on the cross. So that Roman centurion just pokes that spear straight up through his ribs. He gets that rib scar, just like first Adam had a rib scar and got a wife. Jesus the Christ gets a rib scar and 50 days after he um, comes alive again on first fruits, uh, 50 days after that Pentecost, he gets a wife, Ecclesia. And so our original sin is reversed by the spirit, who is symbolic of water. It's a spirit, though, when he goes back inside your temple. And of blood and of, water, of, of the water. Jesus is blood and water and spirit. And then there's a scripture, too, that John talks about. Hold on. Um. These three agree. Hopefully that will be it. Yay! First John 5, 7. This is really important. Oh, it top loaded the King James. Yay! For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, okay, this is not the one I was looking for, but it's okay because there's a sister scripture to this too. And this goes along with it. The Father, the Word, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. Okay, well, let's, we're going to have to dig then because I need the verse that talks about how the spirit, the water, and the blood agree. Yay! And First John 5, 8, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three are in agreement. To, to provide you rebirth at, at repentance through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits. So um, this is really important. And if we accept human testimony, the testimony of God is greater. So God says, look, this is how I'm going to save you. 
this is very, very important. So I would tell you that the water that is so important has to do with Jesus's sacrifice and his blood. And that water is that plasma that's part of the blood. And um, probably a whole lot more could be said about that. But basically what water baptism is not what saves you what he did on the cross and trusting in that is what saves you although there is certainly a baptism where you do get dunked in water that's another discussion for another day that is not efficacious towards saving you what jesus christ said on the cross that simple gospel where you trust in the death row and resurrection for that grace that is exclusively how you get saved and that is actually what remediates this issue of original sin in that the Holy Spirit comes and indwells your temple now. And you are called what is reborn or what is called reborn. Made a child of God and an heir of heaven. Provided she dies in grace. So our grace is a done deal. Hers apparently is maybe if things work out for you later, shucky darn. She is born again and at that moment becomes a member of the Roman Catholic Church and is subject to its laws. Well, they just, they take the same language, but they do what all cults do. They just pour in a different meaning. That's not what born again means. Koibe. Baptism is undergone by believers in Christ to show their identification with him in death, burial, and resurrection. Because that's what the Bible says. And that's all very, very, very good. Yes. When you come up out of that water, it is as though you're being glorified. And, and this Jerusalem who is pictured in Galatians 4.26 that we talk about sometimes is the personification. That's a literary device. A personification of the gospel. And she gives birth to a man-child in Revelation. 12, 3 through 5. It is that one new mankind in Christ. So you're being birthed in that. It is a picture, a literary tool to show you the glorification of the saints, the sons of God. So that's what reborn is. And when you come up out of that water of baptism, so see the death is like you're dying with him, right? And then the, the going down in the water is like you're being buried with him in a watery grave, right? And he was buried in the tomb. And um, metaphorically, he's burying your infection of sins in the earth. Metaphorically, right? You had to learn how to read and use the literary tools that the Bible gives you because there's a lot going on in it. And then when you come up out of the water, that, that water splashes up and it is as though you are being, it's a picture of being born again when you receive your new flesh. Right. And just like your first birth, you left the amniotic fluid. It is a picture illustrating, trying to help people understand how to get born again. And when so you're justified and then you're sanctified. And then that last piece of the puzzle that goes along with the glorification of the saints that Romans 8 talks about. When you're baptized, you come out of that water. It is as though you are being born. It's not real amniotic fluid. It is a picture. It is a literary tool. To show you that you are now in eternal glorified flesh, which is what happens here, which also, by the way, is part of the rapture. So the resurrection of the dead and the alive. See how that all goes together? That is what needs to happen. Not you join a church and get dipped in water. We're being lied to. Let's do one more. I don't want this to go too long, but the sacrament of penance. Ooh, what is this? By this sacrament... Sins committed, oh, brother, after baptism are forgiven through absolution by the priest. No, no, the blood and the water and the spirit of Jesus, the anointed, the Messiah. That's what forgave me. And how many of my sins got forgiven? Uh, it's, uh, is it Colossians 2? All my sins are forgiven. And it's that. It's that word. It's like panta or something like that. Um, let me see if I can find it. Here it is. It's right here. Forgiving you all trespasses. Why well, do you love going to Bible Hub? Love it. Love it, love it, love it. Go Greek. 
So here was your state. You were dead, being in trespasses, that is sin. And in the uncircumcision of the flesh, meaning you're connected to Adam. And he made you alive together with him, having forgiven part of your sins. No, there it is. Panta, C-P-A-N-T-A. All, that's Greek. It's just basic Greek. It's the adjective. How many sins? All of your sins. Strong's 3956. All, the whole, every, including all forms of, what is that word? Declension? Apparently a primary word, all, any, every, like all of them. Past, present, future. All sins are forgiven. You know why? Because you become a new creation. Um, the Catholic Church would have you apply uh, a little dab of grace for every little sin you confess. And then a, a man is uh, your mediator, not Jesus the Christ. See how it's a different gospel? See how it's a different Jesus? See how it's a different religion? See how it is a different path that is on that broad road that does not lead you to that narrow road that Jesus talked about, that I planted that scripture in my heart when I was a little kid. Didn't understand how it all worked, but I got I got that part that there's a narrow path and a gate and a door. It's Jesus Christ and there's no other way in and few be that find it. And check. <laughs> Chuck betrayed us all. And so, so close to the end, you know, the Bible talks about finishing well, finish the race well. Don't just start out well, finish it well. This kind of breaks my heart, but you know what? I don't want to make this about me. I want to make this about the Bible. I want to elevate that Bible up to that position of honor and glory. Jesus Christ, that beautiful kind loving god that was so clear and then you got man all around and he's they're not holding the line they're not telling man the truth the only way that we can be saved is through rebirth through the death burial and resurrection of jesus do not trust your leaders above your rabbi who is jesus and his word well, thank you very much. I did want to keep this one uh, fairly short and to the point and join me because we will continue looking into the differences of Catholicism and uh, Christianity rebirth. And there are other voices that lend credence and support to Chuck Smith. So we're going to be looking at all that stuff too. Thank you so much. And I appreciate Seb's comments are lovely and uh, likes are very helpful. Thank you.